welcome. I'm calling to order this meeting of the Arlington Select Board on Monday, March 6, 2023. I am Select Board Chair Linda Diggins, and I will now confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Diane Mahan. Affirmative. John Hurd. Yes. Steve Corsi. Yes. Eric Helmuth. Yes. Staff, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Sandy Puller. Yes. Doug Heim. Yes. Ashley Meyer. Yes. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington Select Board is being conducted in a hybrid format consistent with Chapter 107 of the Acts of 2022, signed into law on July 17, 2022, which further extends certain COVID-19 measures regarding remote participation until March 31st, 2023. Before we begin, please note the following. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. It is being recorded and is also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Second, persons wishing to join Zoom excuse me, persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that you may be visible to others and that if you wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. Third, all participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using the Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each note tonight will be taken by roll call. So next on the agenda is the land acknowledgement. I would like to read the land acknowledgement that the board supported in the spring of 2021 and that was adopted at the 2021 annual town meeting. We acknowledge that the town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe. The tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. So next item on the agenda is an update on the town manager search process. I'll turn to Mr. Heim. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. I just, I'll keep it brief. Um, I have transmitted a formal letter to the Division of Local Government. Um, outlining the process the select board engaged in to retain Mr. Lynch, appoint a preliminary screening committee, and uh, the process the preliminary screening committee engaged in to develop a list of four, well, three uh, finalists and one alternate. Um, but the predicament the board finds itself in, insofar as um, of those, uh, of the four finalists to proceed to the next stage of interview, public interviews before the board, three have withdrawn from consideration. Um, there's not much to do at this point, but wait to see if they provide comment. I want to note for the public and everyone else's understanding that they're not required to provide comment. Uh, the way I've caged it is we'd appreciate any comment, instruction, or concern that they have. Um, and if they don't, the board is planning to proceed, um, uh, you know, as soon as, as soon as possible. So I put out a date within that letter to try to provide some sort of um, structure to it. Um, in researching it, I will say that I feel good that the screening committee has performed its uh, job uh, exactly as it's supposed to under the open meeting law. Um, the fact that there's only one candidate at this point in time for your consideration is a function of those who chose to withdraw rather than the screening committee or anything else. So um, while I feel good about it, I do want to give the Division of Open Government the opportunity to comment just because this is such an important thing and we want to give the public, you know, uh, an understanding of how much this body respects the open meeting law and how much we all do. So um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but the update is I submitted the uh, letter to the Division of Open Government. I'll await their uh, response and comment if they have any. Thank you, Ms. Hine. Turn to my colleagues. Okay. Yes, Ms. Hine. Uh, just so you know, I, I, I've wanted to make sure we're respectful of their time. It's not necessarily respectful to say, give me an answer tomorrow, Division of Open Government, when you don't have to do anything. So I, I did plan it out for the board's tw uh, March 20th meeting. I understand we'd all like to move faster than that, but I just didn't want to submit a letter and say, please get, a, get to us within a week. So um, I, I built it out with that time period in mind. If they respond sooner than that, I'll obviously let the chair know so we can uh, organize uh, any interviews uh, that we want to conduct as soon as possible. Great. Thank that, you. that just answered the only the question I had. So, all right. You know, so with the March 20th timeline, that, that, that works, you know, I think very nicely. So, okay. 
All right, well, we will move on uh, to the consent agenda, minutes of the meeting for February 6, 2023, and uh, 2023 farmer's market, A, the farmer's market approval, and B, the farmer's market Arlington Eats merger with Andy Duane, director of Arlington Eats, and Patsy Kramer, manager of Arlington Farmer's Market. So normally we don't have anyone for the consent agenda. Is that the case? Okay, Correct. fine. All right. I mean, so, you know, approval. Yeah. Second. Okay. So, comments, questions? All right. So, on a motion to approve the consent agenda by Mrs. Mahan and a second by Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hine. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. yes. Mr. Helm. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Dickens. Yes. Mr. Yeah, Ms. Fogg. Thank you. Moving on. Appointments and the Zoning Board of Appeals, Adam LeBlanc. Terms end on March 31st, 2026. Adam here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> yeah, so I want to come up to the microphone, see if it works. You say, do you want to? We might say no. <laughs> no well, yeah. you know, no is okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so. Uh, good to see you again. Yes, uh, good so, evening. So, just want to tell us a few words about me, why you want to be on the zoning board? Uh, yeah, so uh, I am a registered architect in the, in the state of Massachusetts. Um, so I've been working a lot in public affordable housing throughout my career so far. Uh, I've also recently moved to Arlington in the last couple of years. Um, and I've wanted to uh, use my skills to give back to the town. Uh, so when I saw the Board of Appeals uh, position open up, uh, I decided that it would be good to toss my hat in the ring and see what happens. Thank you. Yeah. So, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move approval. It was my pleasure, along with the chair, to interview uh, our applicants for this. And I was uh, pleased at your very thoughtful answers and your awareness of the role of the ZBA and the importance of, of juggling both the opportunities and the constraints in the community. So I look forward to your service and appreciate you stepping up. Thank you. Second. Else? Yeah, I, mean, I enjoyed the interview too, and, 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 and your, um, your, your CV I mean, with um, all your work with affordable housing I mean, is certainly uh, a big plus for me. So, so yeah, I uh, am very enthusiastic about seeing you uh, 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 join the ZBA, and I think, uh, well, we'll see how long before you're a voting member. <laughs> you know, uh, but anyways, I mean, as you, uh, if you don't know already, I mean, the role that you are going to play is, is really important. I mean, and, 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 and the more familiar you are with things, then the more you can contribute, I mean, not only as an uh, associate member, but um, as a full member. So, so uh, on a motion to approve by uh, Mr. Helmuth and a second by Ms. Mahan. Mr. Hine. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Mr. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Appreciate LeBlanc. <laughs> So, um, number seven, Transportation Advisory Committee appointment. And so we have James Duby. Hi. Hi. So, so uh, you're moving up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, I well, go from volunteer to being part of the actual voting team. Yeah. I've been yeah. volunteering for years. So, so. so. Now bump up and pay too, right? <laughs> so, 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 anyways, want to tell us a little bit about why? Um, so, so I've been in Arlington now for eight and a half years after a number of years raising the family in Newton. I love it here. And I walk everywhere in, in Arlington. So it was a natural for me to look at the traffic committee and understand the issues with crosswalks and everything else that are in town because I go through them all the time. I put thousands of miles on since I've been here. I spent uh, the last 31 years working at Raytheon and retired about four years ago now. So I have a lot of extra time to walk around. And, uh, just, I like working with TAC and doing everything we've done so far. I worked on the Victoria Summer Street crosswalk, which I don't know whether that came to all of you or not. That was a piece of work that I did recently. And, you know, being involved in that makes me feel like I matter to the community. And that's kind of very important to me as part being part of our Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Mahan? <clears throat> I'd like to first move approval and say uh, you definitely have a leg up, footing in, all those phrases, uh, uh, being an associate member, and you're also cognizant, aware of the fact that uh, we send a lot of uh, issues, areas to TAP um, that always gives uh, their expertise and 
really exemplar uh, opinions in terms of you know what we can do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times, uh, what we send you along with the request, as you know, isn't necessarily the final product, which right. is why right. we have. And there's opinion and one perspective, and we got to understand multiple perspectives. Exactly, and I and since you're an associate member, I'm. I know you're aware of the most recent, um, I'm not sure if it's appeared before TAC officially, but the Gray Street, Churchill, Gloucester, Ave way. So that, that'll be the next thing coming up that we'll okay. certainly look to your and your colleagues' um, expertise to maybe right. lend a little insight if there's something we can do there. So thank you. We're also you. trying to work on sort of a larger guideline, which I have a friend that works, she's a senior planner for Walk Boston. So I scarfed all of their materials on what they do for their intersections and crosswalks and everything else. They freely shared to us to be able to take it and modify it for Arlington. So we're going to be working that as part of TAC on behind the scenes so when any one of these comes up, we at least know what the options are and kind of the ballpark and the price range because members don't want to come back and say, well, here's a $6 million answer when we've got 50000 bucks or 20000 or whatever the number is. We don't want to be putting in that kind of effort if we know we don't have the budget for we kind of want to have a little bit more knowledge there. So I think that'll help us all. We do seem to have an awful lot of them come our way. So. Yeah. And sort of just rotating out in the strata is the, the chair, I think, at the last meeting. Something that Arlington has not done, um, but we're starting to put out there is sort of what I'll call raised roadways. Uh, okay. So I'm not saying that that is official, but that is just something that you can sort of keep in your toolbox. Um, just moving forward. And I don't know if that's something that's cost prohibitive, uh, and I know it goes case in point to each uh, area that comes before TAC. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Mr. Helen? Gladly second, second that. And, um, and second, my colleague, Ms. Mahan's comments, not only about Gray Street and Churchill, um, and all the other projects that we, we throw at TAC, it, it's a lot. We really appreciate the hard work that you do. Um, I just wanted to mention, I think, to that point of, of Arlington, maybe at a point where we are, some of us in, in the leadership at least are more interested in, in some of the infrastructure-based traffic calming, including raised roadways okay. and, and, tra and speed tables. Um, I recently had a conversation with the DPD, DPW director, Mr. Rademacher, about that, and he sent me a guideline from another community that was that was really well done. It was really a rubric, a, a set of rules about sort of what solutions could be in place where in their town. And okay. um, I thought that was a really interesting idea. You've got plenty to do on the TAC, but I was I, I noticed when you said you, you, thinking about rules, thinking about guidelines. I think that might be a good solution for Arlington, so that we're not just solving each situation blindly, as if it weren't, but they were in context of you know of. of awareness and, and kind of a Tomlin analysis, so. Right. And part of what you both just said, too, is what's on the table and what's not on the table, not yeah. used upon, but. Yeah, and the cost and, and all of that, so yeah, that's good, so, so thank you. Yes, and we've worked mean, together a lot, so, so I, I, I have mean, a lot of confidence, I mean, in, in you, um, what you bring to the board, you know, <laughs> what you've been doing, which has been great, you know, so. So, uh, so thank you very much, James, I mean, and, and looking forward to working with you more. And yeah, we throw a lot attack, you know, maybe too much for the number of people that are there. But there's a solution to that, you know, and so, so we can get some more people, perhaps. I mean, so we'll have that conversation with the, the chair at, at some point because, you know, if we need to get results faster, there's a solution, you know, so we can work on that. But uh, so um, any comments? All right, so on a motion to approve the appointment by Ms. Bahan, and a second by Mr. Helmuth, Mr. Hines. Mr. Yes. Mr. Corsi. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Yes. Yes. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Davis. Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Nice, nice to meet you. Yeah. So, on to warrant article hearings. So, we have article number six uh, <coughs> bylaw amendment conversion of gas station dispensing pumps to self service operation. And then let me pull up, and I think I recall from memory that's going to be in the stamps. And oh. Well, this one. 
Hi, I'm Susan Stamps, town meeting member, Precinct 3, 39 Grafton Street, and I am the sponsor of Article 6 because um, the owner of Eli's gas station who is asking for the warrant article is not a resident of the town. Um, I voted against it last year, but I think they made the change that I was looking for this year which was to have a full service pump as being part of the local bylaw um, rather than someone sitting and having to press a button asking for special service um, that I think a lot of people were going to be uncomfortable with. So I'm very happy about it and I'd like to introduce Attorney Leone who's representing um, the proponents. Thank you. Good, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leone. Good evening, John Leone. I'm Attorney here in Arlington. I'm representing Eli Alcooley and his son Richie, who are the owners of Eli's service station down on Broadway. Um, <clears throat> they're interested in getting a ability to have self-serve station. I drafted the warrant article, um, which you have in front of you, and which I must note that it got over 62 signatures collected within a matter of days of people who were interested in it. Um, <clears throat> Allowing self-service has many benefits for Arlington. And the one of them is a big change from last year is that the bylaw, the way we drafted it, will require at least one of the pumps, one half of the pumps, is a pump on each side, one of the two nozzles, to be attendant serviced. So if someone pulls up and they don't want to use self-service, they can beep their horn, someone will come out from the station and pump the gas for them. Um, so that, that is the biggest change from last year. We built that right into the bylaw. So the bylaw as we drafted it is what you'll see. Um, another benefit would be that to do this, they would upgrade and rehabilitate the stations so it would be a more modern and inviting streetscape. Self-service is a benefit to the customers, to the consumers. Stations will have the ability to stay ho open later and hopefully be able to hire more employees. Right now, Eli relies upon retirees for, to pump the gas. High schoolers don't want to pump gas as in the old days. They just don't want to do that job. So we have ret older retirees out there pumping gas in all sorts of weather, the middle of the summer, the middle of the winter. And if you could get someone else, it, it would be better. It'll also be faster because you can pull in, quickly pump your own gas and pull out. There are 10 gas stations in Arlington. Uh, we've spoken to nine of them, and right now only three are interested in possibly converting to self-service. Um, to convert to self-service, it's going to take an investment of two to three hundred thousand dollars, because they would have to upgrade the islands, the pumps, the canopies, the point of sale system, and the fire suppression systems to meet with the current codes that the state and the federal government put down. So they just can't slap up, um, let self-serve and let people go and they have to make a substantial investment only those three are locally owned businesses they own the station the others the other seven stations well i'm not sure about the sit go up on park ave but they are all owned by the corporate corporations the gasoline companies who rent them out to the owner operators so those owner operators aren't willing to make an investment of two to three hundred thousand dollars into a station they don't own so it's really only those three locally owned stations where they own the station that would be willing to do this. <clears throat> there are also, if I'm going to add as an aside, there are four electric charging stations in Arlington. That these are all self-serve. None of these have a requirement of having a attendant at them. So in fairness to the gas stations and to be equal with the electric fueling stations, so to speak, they should be able to allow to have self-service as well. Um, we as a town should be encouraging these small locally owned businesses any way that we can, and this is one way we can encourage a small locally owned business to stay in business and to stay in town and to keep our economic areas vital and vibrant. Um, gas stations make most of their money, let's face it, on the service stations and the inspections. They only make 10 to 12 cents a gallon 
markup on a gallon of gas. If they're paying their attendants $17 to $20 an hour, which is what they have to pay nowadays, they have to sell 170 to 200 gallons of gasoline per hour just to pay the attendant. So if that attendant was freed up to do service work or something else in the station, it encourages the owners to stay in business and be able to stay in business and actually make a vibrant business and a going concern. The elderly and disabled. The ADA and the Massachusetts gasoline station law require that disabled and handicapped, if you have a placard or a handicap plate, the station is obligated to have someone come out and pump the gas for that person and those, the handicapped and the disabled, would be serviced from the self-serve pump at the self-serve rate. They wouldn't be penalized and be charged the higher if, if they even do a higher rate for the um, attendant served. So that's, you know, that's what ADA requires and that's obviously what we'll do. Um, and this bylaw, as we've drafted it, is in full compliance with the Mass Gasoline Tech Law and the ADA. So I don't know if you have any questions of them or not, but they're willing to answer any questions you may have. We just ask that you all vote in favor of this so that we can present to the town meeting a unified Board of Selectmen vote. Thank you. Any questions? Select Board. Select Board. I'm sorry, Ms. Mahan. No. Uh, Mr. Hurd. I don't have any questions. I was in favor of this last year. I think I like self-serve. I think I said this last year. I'd rather just go and do it myself. And I think really the only objections that I heard was the relative to individuals with disabilities and I think that's been addressed with the full service pump where you can come and you can see that this is full service so I'll move positive action. Yeah, th th thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, just a question uh, from Mr. Arke Lee. In, in terms of the, the, the employee uh, who has to be on call. Right now, how many people do you have pumping gas and how will that change your structure for, for employees if, if, this is, if, if this bylaw is passed? Uh, so right now there's two attendants. There's one a morning shift and there's a night shift. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is just get them out of the cold. <clears throat> Sorry, we're trying to get them out of the cold as well. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. They're pumping out there about 10 hours a day and they go home to their families, they're getting sick, and we're trying to just get them out of the cold as well. So, and a lot of people don't want to work that job. So okay. we're and trying to create more options and working inside as well. Sure, okay, and, and that person will be the person, if someone pulls up to the full? Yeah. They'll be more comfortable to be working inside behind a desk on a computer and helping them out, but if they have to go outside and help out a customer with the full service pump, they'll be more than happy to do that. Okay, all right, and you're comfortable with that setup? Because I, I, yeah. I supported this at the select board level last year, I didn't support it downstairs at town meeting because I, I frankly, I, I felt like we should either remove the um, um, prohibition on self-service in its entirety and then the individual gas station owner can decide whether they want a full service model or self-service model. But from what Mr. Leone said and what you're saying, you're comfortable with this setup having, having a full service pump. Okay, all right. Yeah, okay, all right. Well, I, I, you know, with that, and I'm glad you came tonight to let us know, and I'm um, happy to support it as well. What else? Mr. Helmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good to see you again uh, in person this time rather than the remote experience of, the, uh, of our businessmen last year. Yeah. Um, I do have some questions, and some of this may actually be for town council. Um, First of all, with the way that the, the text of the bylaws has been drafted in the warrant article, I noticed that it does have the take any action and related there too, but would we in our motion or town meeting have the, any ability to modify the text of the bylaws proposed in the warrant article? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I think that uh, while those are ultimately, um, the scope question is ultimately within the purview of the moderator, right. I think there would be some room to modify uh, this proposal it might not be something that you could add a lot of further substantive conditions to 
you might be able to remove some of those conditions. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know that you're necessarily wedded to every single piece in, if that makes sense. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Attorney Heim. Uh, a follow-up question or a different question uh, for Attorney Heim. You noted in your very helpful, as usual, memo that the, re the notification clause may be preempted by, I believe it was state or federal law. Could you elaborate on that? Correct. I'm not certain whether or not, uh, I'll just be frank with the board, I'm not certain whether or not uh, a local bylaw could add conditions with respect to certain, like, environmental regulations that you're required to post on uh, a gasoline pump. I don't know whether you can say, you know, you have to be aware that the combustion of fossil fuels carries with it certain risks. I'm not personally certain of that. Um, there's a wide cadre of, you know, state and federal laws that could impact something like that. It'd be kind of like somewhat analogous to adding an additional warning on like a pack of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not 100% sure whether or not it'd be preempted. Usually we have um, clauses in our bylaws that would allow you to, you know, excise a portion of it without invalidating the entire thing. So it's not a huge deal. I just want to make sure the board was aware of it. No. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Please. Is the helmet? Of course, Mr. Um, a lot of that language is already on the pumps regarding the carcinogenic properties of gasoline, and this language that we put forth was lifted from the City of Cambridge and their bylaws. Oh, great. That's very helpful. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Mr. Heim, please. This is Mr. just for the public. It's, it's Mr. Leone has uh, well researched this, obviously. I just want to let everybody know that. City ordinances do not go to the Attorney General's office for oh, yeah. review. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes we get great ideas from Cambridge, Somerville, uh, Boston, yeah. but nobody looks at their things until somebody objects. So uh, I just want to set the table that a lot of times they, they have great ideas and um, it's something that may or may not be as easy for us, yes. just as a heads up. Th yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, in, uh, in its wisdom, the law uh, requires more adult supervision of towns when it comes to <laughs> lawmaking. Um, so it should, should uh, the AGO, the Attorney General, uh, have a problem with that. Would that affect the viability and invalidate? Can they just invalidate that part of the bylaw? Would, would the rest of it stand? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Correct. That's right. I, I'm not worried about it from the perspective I think it would invalidate the rest of the action. It's just something that, you know, we've seen recently with some unfortunate uh, outcomes. For example, the rodenticide uh, bylaw that we yeah. tried to pass. Um, that was the whole sort of kit and caboodle. This would only be a tiny piece of it. Okay. Um, and, and finally, I'm just looking at the proposed text of the bylaw. I do support this, by the way, you know, unquestionably, as I did last year. Um, so it's, it talks about there, there being at least one full service attendant employee dispensing system. And uh, I think, Mr. Hyman, your, your uh, memo, you kind of interpret that to mean that there would be a full time employee there all the time. But this refers to more hardware or hardware plus the employee. And I, I wonder if the proponents could at least elaborate on the intent. The intent was that. It's, you pull up to a gas pump, it's two-sided, and there's a nozzle on each side. One of those two nozzles will be for the attendant serviced um, side. So if you have six, three pumps, or three, um, three, pumps, pump, six three pumps, six nozzles, one of the five nozzles, one of the six nozzles will be attendant, usually the front one, it's the closest to the door. So the attendant can walk out. So we'll have an attendant there while the station's open to service that nozzle. Okay. That, yeah, We're trying to think a little better word than mm -hmm. nozzle and pump. And yeah, so I found yeah. that language in the other bylaws. Yeah, yeah. No, it's one of you. Yeah, that's trying to describe fine. what we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and finally, um, I think it's, it's helpful that you that you uh, surveyed the, the stations in town. Did you survey they, them with these, this particular proposal or just the idea of self-serve gas the, in general? The idea, Eli talked to all of them. I talked to one or two of myself. Yeah. And just the idea of a self-serve, if they were interested or not. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so three of the 10, well, three of the nine, we, I haven't spoke to the new Sitco owners, but I don't know if they're a renter or not. That's good. Thank you. Um, and I think, um, I appreciate that this is, is minimalist. You know, I think mm -hmm. that last year at town meeting, maybe things got a little bit uh, complex, but it's been useful to me in my own education to, to understand that the existing ADA law already puts out the requirements. The existing state law has the safety you know, requirements. Right. So I think it's, it's good that this is clean. Um, I'm glad to see this back again. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Same here. Same here. So um, you asked all the questions I was going to ask, yeah. you know, and then some. So nothing more for me to add other than I support it. So this is a hearing. 
hand. And so does anyone um, um, in the room or in Zoom land um, have anything you want to say? Um, Ms. Stamps. Hi, Susan Stamps, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 3, 39 Grafton Street. Just one thought. I wanted to say I think this is, would be an awesome thing for Town Meeting to pass because it's consistent with our towns in recent years really trying to be fair, inclusive, have it be a welcoming place for everyone. Um, across from the Starbucks in Concord, there's a gas station with four pumps. One of them is full serve. But I don't know if they're doing it because it says full serve with a different price. I don't know if they're doing that because there's a town bylaw or if that's just what the gas station owner wants to do. Um, I would suspect that most cities and towns who have self-serve gas stations, they're all that way. Um, and so I think this makes Arlington once again stand out as a place that really wants to make everyone feel comfortable. So I appreciate the select board supporting this. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. I'm not seeing any hands. I don't see any in Zoom, no. Okay. No. Well, um, um, sometimes it takes more than one try. I mean, um, that happened with the rodenticide um, um, article. I mean, and so good luck um, in town meeting this time. But first, we need to take a vote here. I mean, so on uh, a vote, positive action by uh, motion by Mr. Hurd and a second by Ms. Mahan. Mr. Hahn. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Dickens. Yes. It's a unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you, board. See you. Eight. See you in the spring. Yeah. So, all right. So, on to Article Seven in the Bylaw Amendment Parking Disclosure Requirement. And uh, so, hi. Hi, I'm Steve Birchuk. I live in Precinct Three on Teal Street. Um, I don't know if you read the attachment I sent, but um, I propose this bylaw because I hear a lot of conversations about overnight parking, but then I also hear people want overnight parking because they didn't realize they couldn't park on the street. So I guess the goal of this bylaw is to set a standard so people are at least informed when they come here. So if we talk about overnight parking or pilot programs or change the rules, it, it's not a reaction to, well, I already live here. I'm in trouble. It's more like I knew what I came in. So, and I was actually kind of curious. I, a lot of anecdotes. Um, I did a very unscientific uh, poll on the Arlington List Facebook group. You know, like 500 people, 30% said they had no idea about the uh, restrictions. So, the uh, you know the idea is just that if somebody were to, and my neighbor actually bought their house and they didn't know about the overnight parking rule, so they put, they did a major renovation. Um, didn't have space for one of their tenants' cars. You know, fortunately we live on a private way. We we're good neighbors, we let them park there. But like, if you can buy a house or rent a house and not know, I mean, immediately, immediately people should, could ask, but apparently people don't. So this is just a way of maybe setting a, a baseline of expectation. I actually could go through more, but I, I'm assuming you. No, it's fine. I mean, <laughs> you've read this, so. Short is fine. We, we generally, yeah. I won't say generally, we always read all the stuff that we get. Okay. I mean, so, so we're all set there. I mean, so I'll turn to my, my colleagues. I don't see if anyone wants to speak to it. I'm still deciding. All right. You know, so if, to us, yeah, if no one has anything to say at this point, then we'll, we'll turn to. Um, I, guess I have a question. Yes, yes. Right. Please, Mr. Hellman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, are you aware of any uh, other communities that have done anything like this for I, guidance on precedent? I did ask people. I asked some people who were formerly in town government or are in town government. Apparently not. So um, this could be new. Uh, town council seems to think it's nothing. Preventing it from happening, but <laughs> seeing a nod from Attorney Hine. Uh, yeah. Correct. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. And so um, we'll turn to the um, audience here and in Zoom land to see if there are any um, statements anyone wants to make. I see no hands raised at this time. No. Mr. Hurd. Um, Thank you for your effort on this, and I know it's, it's no small task to put together one article and get signatures. Um, I applaud the what you're trying to accomplish here, and I think 
you know, we've been dealing with the overnight parking issue for a couple of years, and part of that discussion has always been, I, didn't, I moved to the property and didn't know that there was parking yeah. restriction. I guess as a real estate attorney and, <laughs> and a select board member, I come from this as, I am very hesitant to pick out one town by law and say, all right, owners that are leasing property or I don't know who would have the obligation, whether it's a seller, sellers don't talk to buyers, a realtor, because there's out of, out of town realtors, there's out of town attorneys that handle transactions. I'd be very hesitant to put, pick up one town bylaw and say that when you're representing somebody that's buying a house or, or selling a house or leasing a property, you have to know this one town bylaw. And I get that it's relative to what you're talking about. It's an important one. But there could be others, and I think there's others bylaws that someone could argue. But, well, they should tell this one too, yep. and it becomes a sliding scale. And we, as attorneys, realtors, um, if you're someone that just leases property, which who are m m much less likely to be aware of both bylaws and state laws, but we're all generally schooled on state law because that's who would affect certain types of transactions like this. So. I'm going to move to action again. I, I definitely understand what, where you're coming from with this, but it, I'm just again hesitant to to put an obligation on someone that conflict. Like attorney, we talked about the last one is there are state required disclosures, like lead paint, that the seller has to know, and I would be hesitant to start adding to the list of town bylaws that someone has to disclose so again yeah. Yeah. so yeah the the other I mean the uh, what I imagine would happen is the requirement would be very minimalistic minimal of saying you know look at the town new residence page on the website you know there are important rules there you need to know and parking was the impetus I mean you could I could imagine this you know being there anything that you know becomes important we could put there but maybe that becomes too broad but sure. I do see your point yep. Did I move no action? You did. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, no problem. Yeah, no problem. Mr. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll second Mr. Hurd's motion, and, and I do want to thank you for, for bringing this up. I'm particularly concerned about renters who um, don't really control their parking spot, not maybe told, um, because we've heard some stories about that, too. Um, in terms of buyers, I, I think Mr. Hurd makes a good point in terms of what can be in there. I'm also concerned about enforcement and who's going to undertake the enforcement and uh, how that how that would work. And, and I think in a in a purchase and sale situation, it, it's probably that the, the buyer um, probably has a higher responsibility to know you know what the what the parking is at, as opposed to a renter. But it does concern me to pick this out. Um, as I said, the enforcement. But I, I do think the more we can get the message out to realtors in town that that is something that, that people um, you know, should be aware of, and, and not so much through a bylaw, but through word of mouth. But uh, I think it's an important issue. I just, for me, it doesn't quite rise to the level of putting it in the bylaw. And, and honestly, I, I just, you know, I think the conversation is important. So if the result of me coming here is it, it, the town does a Bit, bit of a push of making this information more prominent on the website and communicates to sellers and I think that would be a win too sure. um, having said that apparently that hasn't worked to date <laughs> so um. yes Mr. Thomas thank you I, I will pile on in both ways um, <laughs> I genuinely appreciate your spirit of con your constructive spirit in this um, and um, and I know I think the reasons for it are really good the problem is really important, um, and I and I am also worried about the precedent. I think you know we have snow removal bylaws and leaf blower and all kinds of things, and it's it's. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm also concerned about pulling one thing out, particularly with the fine attached to it, and um, I think, however, that the timing is good, and I think you may succeed in the goal of awareness, uh, in that this body, if you stick around later tonight, may learn more about it. Um, to, and I think you're, you're aware that we're, yep. we're thinking about how to solve more people's problems with overnight parking. And um, I hope that that, if we are able to launch a new provision in some way, that that can be part of a new community conversation and continue to raise awareness about it. 
Um, so, uh, so that's where I'm at too. All right, thank you. So, you think more signage would help? I, I think I think the trade-off is more signs would be. Depending, you know, if you put them on every street, that would probably you know create like a lot of visual clutter and would make people unhappy. Um, this, this, this question is: would it, Do you think it would work? Pardon? Do you think it would work? Um, I think if there were more signs, I, probably that would be part of it. I mean, you know, I think, um, you know, part of me resists having like you know signs on like you know every ten oh, feet on the street. I just want to know if you think that signs, more signs, would work. I mean, yeah, sorry, I think some you. signage could help because I think a lot of people are saying the little like "Welcome to Arlington," you know, <laughs> it's overnight parking prohibited. It's like, <laughs> is I mean, I think I noticed it when I first came moved here, but that's because there was actually probably less stuff going on because there was less going on in the town twenty years ago. <laughs> so the sign stood out more. All right, all right so so um, $100 for a fine. Do you think a higher fine would be uh, an incentive? I, and I actually, I think there was a limit based on what a bylaw fine would be, uh, Council Heim mentioned, so I, I couldn't remember the exact number, but it was around $100. Yes. $300, Mr. Chair. Is a max. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. All right. All right. Just, I mean, I mean just. To, 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 quite honestly, I believe that, you know, this is a weird situation that if suddenly you're like, they never told me, oh, I have this, you know, you're stuck, you live here, you have a lease. Um, so I think it's, I think it's more of a setting a baseline, baseline behavior, like, you know, um, there's someone say, oh, look, there's a bylaw about this, this must be important. I, I can ask, I can ask my realtor, or realtors will know, or uh, like I said, if, if, if this raises transparency, if this conversation raises transparency and awareness, I think it's a win, so. Well, I think I'd like to go for like I mean, putting up more signs. You know, uh, uh, I mean, we may not have to have them on every street, you know, but but maybe on more streets, more prominent streets. I mean, so that it increases the chances that when someone comes to town, I mean, they realize that, you know, and and I think the more people that know it, I mean, then then the more it just becomes common knowledge. I know that's a little circular and tautological, yeah. but but um, but anyways, you know, yeah, I, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm going to make this unanimous, you know, in terms of the, the no action. So, um, any other comments, questions? All right. So, on a motion of no action by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mr. DeCourcy, Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Helman? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. It's unanimous vote. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. okay. Take care. So moving on, you know, the next article is um, legal notices. You know, special legislation allowed digital legal notices. Yes, Mr. Oh, MJ. Uh, Mr. Chair, I need to recuse myself from this uh, because it is special legislation <coughs> and I am employed by the state legislature due to the conflict of interest law. All right, all right. All right. All righty. So um, it's a uh, special legislation allowed digital legal notices. Uh, Mr. Slotnick. Yes. Hello. How are you doing? Good. And um, you know, I'm sorry I'm not there in person. I it's okay. probably could have it's, made it. I feel like uh, I don't know. It's quite an right. outcast. You, you, you look great. You know, by the way. You know, in, in the <laughs> audience, so I'm Do I look to... relaxed here? Yeah. Uh, should I start? Yes. Yeah, please. All right. Well. Um, this is brought about uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one, I'll, I'll just start by saying we, we've probably all heard about the diminishing uh, local, uh, local, locally owned print news coverage uh, in Massachusetts and around the country. Uh, it's affected Arlington with you know the merger of the Advocate with uh, the Winchester Star and. Uh, we're just about celebrating the first anniversary of Gannett, uh, which is the owner of, uh, which is Gatehouse Media slash Wicked Local. Uh, that's when they announced that they were taking 19 Massachusetts local newspapers out of print. Um, so we're, we're one year beyond when that happened. Now, I became aware uh, of this, uh, Ish, this particular issue about legal notices a little more acutely when I learned, you know, that uh, when the Bedford Minuteman 
which was one of Gannett, was one of Gannett's papers, was taken out of circulation, they were f required, you know, still required, uh, according to Commonwealth of Massachusetts statute, to publish legal notices that would be published, say, by their zoning, you know, planning department, by their town clerk, uh, DPW, perhaps. They then had to start using uh, the Lowell Sun for their legal notice printing at a significantly higher cost than what uh, the Bedford Minuteman was, uh, was charging. So uh, to bring it you know, local to Arlington, um, I happen to be in the same place, the same space uh, one evening with both Julie Brazil and Bob Sprague. You know, Bob publishes your Arlington you know, news website. And uh, we were talking about this issue uh, about legal notices and Julie, uh, who puts in a, a bunch of town of the town's notices. Uh, I, I circulated three documents to you, to the select board. One of them was a small spreadsheet that showed legal notice advertising in fiscal year 2022. The planning department was the largest, uh, probably followed by the select board, actually. Um, DPW had some, et cetera. Julie told me that she would have to place legal notices in the Boston Globe if the advocate slash star, you know, Winchester Star stopped uh, print uh, publication uh, unless uh, we somehow got permission from the state to publish legal notices digitally. Um, so in thinking about that, you know, I, th I think we're all aware that the town upgraded its own website, you know, over the past, it was like, seemed like it was a pandemic era project that was taken on and completed, you know, it, I think, does a lot better at getting information out there. Uh, it's not the flashiest. Uh, I don't know how many town residents use it or rely on it for information. Um, but the, you know, the basic idea is that seeing how more and more people are getting their local news either through uh, you know, arlingtonma.gov, the town's website, or a local digital paper like yourarlington.com, uh, which is now operates as a nonprofit uh, after about 14 to 15 years uh, being run as a for-profit, um, that this sort of thing was a reasonable, this, uh, the idea behind this article was reasonable and it was backed up by the fact that the town of Bedford is going to be voting on a similar uh, article at their town meeting this spring. Um, I circulated, uh, included two other documents uh, in, the, in that group of three that I shared uh, with the select board. And uh, one of them came from my own experience of being the facilities manager at Foodlink where when I am putting projects through for which we've been granted funds through the community development block grant, which is federal money, I've had to take out legal notices to advertise uh, projects. And one of them was one I included, which was for a backup emergency generator. Uh, about a year and a half ago is when we started that project. Uh, you know, the estimated cost was in the 10 to $12,000 range. Uh, I placed two ads in the Advocate Star. Uh, each posting, you know, had a price of $190. You know, that was last year's price. And I even thought that was a little pricey, but whatever. Uh, so we did it. Um, we completed that project. That's all good. Uh, just about a week or two weeks ago, I went onto the Boston Globe's website and they have a nifty tool. It's kind of a self-service, you know, legal advertising placement uh, tool where you put your own tech, you know, copy in there. You can adjust some different features for how it's presented, one column, two column, different kind of headers and so forth. Uh, 
pretty much the same language, same a, a number of words that I did for the the Advocate Star, which, uh, again, which is connected with Wicked Locals. And they tell you the price, and that price, as is shown in that file I sent to you guys, is $960 for each placement for the same ad. Um, so that is astonishing to me. Uh, I don't know if the town could negotiate special rates with the Boston Globe if it ended up having to place all its legal notices in the Globe, but uh, at least their retail price is, uh, you know, about four times or more than four times higher than, uh, than Wicked Local. The other piece is that uh, more and more people are getting, you know, getting news from the town's website and uh, a, an online publication like your Arlington. I mean, this is where Arlington residents are more and more getting their information and less and less subscribing to The Advocate or going online and reading wickedlocal.com because honestly their coverage of Arlington uh, happenings is just diminishing. Uh, that paper actually is much more highly focused on Winchester for some reason than it is Arlington. So the idea of this article is just to create a level playing field uh, where anyone who's say at whatever director level or anyone who's charged, whether it's planning, uh, select board office, the clerk, possibly the health department, DPW, uh, it would give them a choice of whether the notice that they want to publish, that they have to publish, it will achieve the results that they want better. If it's printed in the Advocate Star, they could choose that. If they feel they'd really think it would do better in a hyper-local publication, you know, such as the town's own website or uh, or a local news site, they could make that choice and in the process probably save, uh, you know, a little money now while the Advocate Star is still in print and uh, possibly uh, a lot of money uh, if that paper goes out of print. All right, um, Slotnik, I think we yeah. got it. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so, so anything else you want to add as you wrap it up? No, I just hope uh, you folks will uh, consider and uh, support. Okay, great. So, Mr. Hurd? I just want to clarify, um, I guess, Attorney Haim. Did, right now, does the town place ads on what, in digital form? Are we able to put legal notices on your Arlington? Or is this authorizing us to do so? Exactly, Mr. Hurd. The, the, the law does not allow us to solely advertise digitally. We would have to get permission from the state to locally be able to advertise digitally only. So, okay. I just want to step back and rephrase. So I guess where I'm going is <laughs> I don't think – as long as we have an advocate in print, I think there's some people that use it and that some people that might look in the print av advocate in order to get their legal notices. And if all of a sudden the town stops, then they're not going to get their legal notices. But I also think it's important for the town to have an avenue to simultaneously advertise in, in say, your Arlington. Are we able to do both right now? So not just exclusively in uh, digitally, but if we would we be able to advertise in both places? Right now, the town is required to advertise in a newspaper of general circulation. We can advertise more heartily and put it more online. We tend to put most of our legal notices on our website already, for example, or a form of them. Um, what I think Mr. Slotnick's article is getting to is that we do not have the choice to not run a print ad. Right. So if the advocate goes out of, stops circulating in Arlington, our only, not our only, but our most likely next choice is the Boston Globe or the Herald. I understand that. So you, I, I think what you're, I'm sorry, Mr. Yeah. yeah, I understand what you're asking. Yeah. 
So I, I just think I'm, and I'll wait to hear from my colleagues, I'm still hesitant while the advocate is in circulation to remove that requirement. And I think we would probably have a little bit of notice if the advocate was, and that's not guaranteed, but if we had to advertise in the Boston Globe for eight months till the next town meeting and we could then take on this article at that time, I'd be more comfortable with that. Yes, that's right. Through the chair. Yeah, yeah. Chairman. yeah I'm sorry. I, I, I want to make clear one thing. Um, right now, if you run an article, uh, you run an ad in a print new, uh, publication, which you're required to do, they have to run it in their online version. We don't necessarily, that, that's a relatively recent addition. So by doing one, you sort of have to do the other. Yeah. Uh, but I think Mr. Slotnick's article is, is suggesting that we still could continue these practices, but we would have the discretion not to run it in print if we didn't want to. Right. If I understand correctly, Mr. Slotnick. And so, Mr. Slotnick? Yeah, can I chime in? Yes. Um, uh, <coughs> Mr. Hurd, your, your comment was echoed by one of the uh, select board members who was a signer of the petition, who's also an attorney. Uh, and I think attorneys are more, uh, they just live in more of the genre of legal notices. They're called legal notices. Um, so I, I think the tendency would be, so you won't see like a mortgagee sale of real estate legal notice on the town's website for sure, or probably not in the advocate either. That would still say, stay uh, you know, whoever is behind that, an attorney, you know, a, a law office, a real estate attorney would place that in the print publication of record, you know, as is the current law. But, it, I, you know, this, this article is geared towards the types of notices that are really uh, oriented towards town resident readership, you know, election related things. Um, you know, zoning, uh, you know, you could say zoning does have interest from entities outside of Arlington, but I just wanted to, I'm not going to talk further about it. I think I'm getting the point across. It's the kind of articles you tend to see online. Got it. Thank you. Mr. Hurst. I'll just follow up briefly and just say, I understand that aspect of it, but again, I just think there's a certain, still, I, I, as we all transition to the digital world, I think there is still a certain portion of the town it still gets legal notices including information on elections and and zoning board of appeals hearings and whatnot through the print version of the advocate and I'm not against the idea I think a lot of Arlington residents do get most of their information online so it would be good to have a practice where the town is posting in both if your Arlington has a legal notices section, the town should be posting in both. And if it costs us a few extra bucks, it does. But I still think as long as we have a paper, we should use it. So, so that's a statement. I mean, no. Uh, I'm not going to make a motion right now. Okay, I'll, that's fine. I'll see what my colleagues. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. Mr. DeCourcy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you, Mr. Slotnick, for bringing this issue up because I think it's, we're getting to that point where we clearly are, are going to need alternatives. You didn't send us any proposed language. I see the Warren article. There wasn't a, a proposed um, home rule petition that you sent to us. Did, I, I, I saw what you forwarded yeah, to us, but is that right? Uh, sorry, that, that is correct. I, I did not, did not. Uh, because I, I don't know, maybe there's a way to parse this out a little bit too, because I, I'm aware of at least one community that is trying to do this, and that's the town of Franklin. And what they did is they're doing it just for public notices that require a hearing, um, as opposed to all legal notices. And so in that situation, abutters are gonna be, be served anyway by certified mail, so they're gonna receive notice. I see we have a visitor there. Uh, Sorry. And, uh, I don't know, you mentioned public hearings, but, but the, the language in, in um, the Warren article is much broader than that. And, and I wonder um, if there's a way to maybe take a smaller subset 
of the of the notices um, because public hearing type notices I could be more comfortable with that because I I know people who are affected directly are going to get notice anyway as opposed to some of the other legal notices and just wondering what your thoughts are on that um, making a smaller subset yeah, yeah. Um, well I I'd, I'd have to think that over a little uh, let me add one thing I, I didn't get a chance to say was you know when I presented the idea of of this article and then the the two files that talk about the costs of a advocate posting and a potential you know Boston Globe posting so I emailed that information to Julie Brazil uh, Mike Rademacher Claire Ricker uh, Natasha at Health Department um, Julie and Mike, uh, who have seen the language that you're looking at, both replied positively that they'd be in favor of it. They, they didn't share a lot of thoughts beyond those words. Uh, uh, but I didn't hear back from Claire, and you know, uh, uh, her department probably, as I said before, does publish the largest number of notices. Um, and I was anxious to chat with her, but we just weren't able to do it before tonight. So I, I'm up for having that conversation with her and, you know, as you said, try to parse through what could be a, a more acceptable, you know, form of language for this. Um, I don't know that, where that would leave us for tonight. Um, Mr. Chair, if I, if I may ask it. So, Mr. Slotnick, what you're referring to that they reacted favor favorably to is the the language in the warrant article itself. That's correct. Okay. All yeah. right. That was about Julie and Mike Rademacher. Yeah. And I just didn't get a response from Claire or from the, uh, I guess, Ashley at the select board. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, tonight's the night of the hearing. We don't have this, but I, I'd be willing depending on what the other members think. I mean, if, there, if there's something that, that you feel that you could bring back to the board, if the board's so inclined, you may, people may just want to vote this evening, that's more narrowly tailored and it actually has specific language that you've heard Mr. Hurd's concern about um, language and still being in the newspaper. I mean, if I, I'd be willing to, to table this or make a motion to table this, um, but if, if that the three other members are already there in terms of where they are in this, and I, 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 won't, I won't stand in the way of that. I appreciate that. Well, oh, can I say a quick oh, thing? Or so, so, yeah, Larry, um, briefly. All right. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, just for Mr. Hurd. Uh, yeah. So, if, if the concern is that uh, if it were to pass town meeting and then the select board follow the what's stated in the article to petition uh, the, the state, um, y your concern is that uh, the overarching thing would be to save money by not doing the, the print advocate publishing and, and, and instead use the town's website or say your Arlington and, and not have uh, it, it print published. So if the language were simply, uh, you know, changed to, uh, to make it worded a little differently, uh, around that idea, would, do you think that would improve the article in your opinion? Instead of well, parsing out which types of articles? I would say um, this generally isn't a question and answer of the <laughs> select board uh, situation. I'm sorry. We ask questions. Um, and I'm not sure that completely followed my concern. My concern is that I think as long as we have a paper, there's people that get a benefit of getting notices in the paper. Um, yeah. And I just, it just seems to me not overly burdensome for the town departments to have to post, do something that we've been doing for years and years. Um, but again, whatever my colleagues, I guess if I can yes. make, and I don't want to take Ms. Mahan's time if she has a question, but Attorney Heim, this is a shot in the dark which I think probably this will be too confusing, but can we write a warrant article that says that it will, 
we're obligated to post in print media as long as there's a local paper, but that obligation expires if there's no local paper. <clears throat> Mr. Chair? Yes. And the answer can just be no. <laughs> I, I think we can submit special legislation on whatever we want. Yeah. And we could define a local paper with some specificity and have a sort of triggering event. So I think that that is possible. I think it's likely possible the way this article is constructed, um, which, and I understand that the select board's turn to speak, so I, uh, Mr. Slot, can I correct me if I misapprehend his one article? I believe that the point is to offer us the option, not to necessarily require us to take a specific course of action. So I think, yes, Mr. Hurd, you could do something along those lines as what the legislature's response to that would be. I don't know, but, but yes, I think you could. I get, and I get that what, the, what we're asking here <laughs> this is the option, and I would envision that if given the option that, that some town departments would exercise that option. I guess what I'm uncomfortable is taking away that requirement on them. And I'd be comfortable if, if you're telling me that we can essentially write whatever we want, just calling out the Arlington Advocate or some sort of lineal affiliate. Yes. Matt? Yes. Yes. Uh, as, as, as we've had a previous discussion, sometimes special legislation can get very, very specific within 75 feet of Arlington uh, uh, <laughs> Catholic comes to mind. Yeah. Um, so, 75 yards. 75 yards. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. DeCourcy. Um, so, yes, could you have special legislation that said specifically the Arlington Advocate or its legacy, um, you know, businesses or institutions? Yes, you could. Um, <coughs> we'd have to take some pretty, we'd have to take great care to make sure that we articulate that uh, very clearly. Because, I mean, I don't envision that if the Arlington Advocate goes out of print, Anyone's going to go and say, wow, that seems like a good market to open up a new m newspaper. So I, <laughs> I mean, again, I think I've stated my concerns and I don't want to belabor this. I just, I think as long as we have a newspaper, we should use it. And I think people, it seems crazy <coughs> to some of us that people read the, the print paper, but I actually like reading the paper <laughs> like that. So, um, I think we should keep the requirement as long as we have a local paper. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I agree with Mr. Hurd um, regarding right now we do have the Arlington Advocate. Um, I also agree that more is more and that's the way to go, um, which, which is what I think Mr. Hurd is saying. I will definitely um, second Mr. Um, DeCourcy's motion to table to A, see if there's a subset that language that can be presented, and B, and I, I, I mean no sarcasm or anything by this to Mr. Slotnick or anyone else, but I really, it, I understand that you, you've had communications with a couple of department heads. Um, I don't know if it would be appropriate for Ms. Greco to uh, try to tell her five bosses uh, how to vote or what to do. So I don't know if that's part of the reason um, not to uh, respond to that. But I, when you're present, presenting something to me, you can read an email from me um, and then give your interpretation of it. And maybe, God bless you. It may not be what I feel I said in the email. So um, I guess what I would say to that is uh, for me quoting you know, any town employee, including the department head, unless it's before me, I, that, that, I have to take that as the official record and, and it, opinion because I've, I've seen in the past where I posed a question to a town employee, um, but it was concerning pile A, not concerning pile B, and then it gets presented as an argument for pile B and they say that's not that. So I would just say moving forward, unless, you, unless we have something from a department head or they're here, that she or he really needs to speak for themselves. Um, and, and again, I don't mean that sarcastically. I just, um, so I guess going forward, I don't know if maybe, um, I'm not trying to create any work, but if 
if the t if the town manager was so inclined um, that we he feels he needs to get a quick sense of um, how any department head actually would weigh down on this particular issue. But right now, I would I would not be inclined to support it. I've seconded Mr. DeCourcy's motion to table it to see if some subset language can come up and moving forward. Um, either if the manager can give us a sense from the other department heads or Mr. Slotnick, if you want to encourage them to somehow communicate with the board, that's really the best way to go. Because, you know, I can say, you know, I spoke to all the department heads and they think that um, Jane Doe is the best person who ever walked the face of the earth. But and then come to find out that's not what they said. So anyways, so I've second the uh, motion to table and it, it's Mr. Diggins, the chair, said it is a public hearing, but yes. that's where I would go. Yeah, that's fine. You know, so yeah, I'll, I'll go along with the table. You know, I was I was interested in seeing you know, more specifics on the the, um, the, legis the proposed legislation. You know, uh, you know, it, it'll uh, probably come as no surprise <laughs> that I am fine. You know, with with going <clears throat> the digital route. You know, <coughs> it's me. It, 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 it's me. And I, I certainly uh, I, I get I me. Mean, Holding the paper to, you know, uh, 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 although the, I got to tell you, as my vision gets worse, I mean, um, it is nice to be able to expand that font size. I mean, and it's nice to be able to move the the pad anyway. But you know, um, uh, I, mean, I think um, I think this this whole thing is going to resolve itself. I mean, you know, in a decade or two. Anyways, I mean, and so the, where we, it's clear where we're headed, you know, um, and it's just a matter of um, how fast we get there. But uh, so, yeah, um, I, I'm fine with that. So this is a hearing, you know, uh, so if any um, comments um, from Ms. Ms. Stamps and then Zoom land, raise your hand electronically. Ms. Stamps. Hi, Susan Stamps, uh, 39 Grafton Street. Larry and I talked when he was, hi, Larry, when he was um, drafting this. It occurs to me listening to the conversation that it does make sense to file the home rule petition asking for this to go into effect um, when we lose our local newspaper, which we will, as we all know. But in the meantime, it would be nice to make part of the, um, the motion that legal notices will be printed on the town website and in your Arlington. So that would be my suggestion. As long as we're dealing with legal notices, let's make them electronic and accessible to everyone. There's, there's no reason not to wait that I can think of. So thank you. Anyone else? OK. You know, you know. The pipes want to say something. Yeah, really. No, you were going to go to Zoom. Sorry. No, no, no. no. I was just looking to see. No, the, uh, okay, so, so, um, so I think I'm well set here. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Floor. I would just say that uh, following Ms. Mahan's request, I will pull the department heads and report back to the board. Thank you. you know, you're not raising a hand, are you? It's, it's not a hand. I, I thought I saw you raise your hand. You're all set. All right. All right. So, uh, all right. So on a motion to table by Mr. DeCorsi and a second by Mrs. Mahan, Mr. Um, Sorry to yeah. interrupt. There is one hand raised. It came in late, but okay, well, we'll, we'll, do you want me to? Yeah, please. Oh, Danny boy. Ms. Weber? Um, my name is Susan Weber, Precinct uh, 17, One Water Mill Place, town meeting member. I just wanted to say that um, I, like everybody I know, has canceled their subscription that we had for 10 or 15 or 20 years to the Arlington Advocate because they were, um, it was disappointing. And sorry about this. Um, and uh, so I'm hoping I read your Arlington every week and I'm hoping that there's another way to see the notices, um, since for people like me, that's the only way we're going to see them. So I hope that you can make some kind of a decision that will ensure that um, those of us who want to know what's going on in town uh, and look digitally will have the opportunity to find what we need to find. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. So getting back to the mo you keep raising. <laughs> so that's not a hand raise. All right. So okay, no problem. All right. So um, all right. So um, on a motion table by Mr. Corsi and a second by Mr. Mahan. Mr. Heim. And if the board just doesn't have to have a vote on this, I'll maybe have a conversation with Mr. Zlotnick to try to see if we can get this into a form that the board can sort of decide, is this something we want to move forward with? Is that a fair? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Yes. Mr. Helmuth recused himself. It's a 4-0 vote. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. You're welcome, Mr. Kalatnik. Take care. Okay. So moving on to article number 63, a resolution to file and accept gifts with and from EOEEA for land and water conversion fund grant program. And, and let's see who that's by. Mr. Diggins, man? Yes, Mr. Hamlin. Go ahead. Oh, okay. No, I guess not. I'm sorry. I have the wrong name there. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Diggins. Um, the long and short of it is that um, this is a requirement of the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs to do something we think we're already authorized to do. Right. So we think the Town Manager Act already authorizes the Town Manager to basically engage in this, um, but with the Board's positive action, I'll essentially draw something up that just confirms this general idea that, yes, we already have what we have. So I'm just looking for a vote so that I can uh, draw this up and uh, get it through town meeting so they have what they need for us to accept certain grants. Right. Mr. Hurd. Move positive action. Second. Any comments, questions? I know technically, I mean, we have to, you know, hear from folks, you know, so, so I'll just look to see if there are any comments, questions um, from the audience here or in Zoom. Seeing no hands raised. Okay. All right. I mean, so on uh, a uh, motion by Mr. Hurd to vote positive action and a second by Ms. Mahan, you know. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. Mr. Helmut. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. Okay. Unanimous vote. Okay. Thank you. So moving on to article number 60, seven. Okay, article 67, resolution or affordable housing overlay. Mr. Hamlin. Yep, present. Uh, my name is Guillermo Hamlin. I'm a precinct 14 town meeting member. This is my first time presenting to you in person, so this is pretty surreal. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present to you uh, this resolution affirming affordable housing overlays. What uh, inspired me to seek this out was perhaps if you remember, I had sought to study these about maybe two years earlier, a year earlier. Um, it was voted no action due to a commissioned housing production plan. And I concur that that was the right move. The housing production plan actually did and went far beyond what I expected it was going to do. Provided a factual basis, it was very data driven, it sought public input. Initially, I thought to just comprise a study committee that kind of was a little more narrower. And I found, <coughs> in hindsight, that that wasn't the right course of action. Now, in terms of this resolution, I drew inspiration from Brookline Town Meeting. They decided to do kind of a weird hybrid of what I initially wanted to do and what I'm presenting now, which is a series of resolution, a series of affirmative statements, and then a direction to comprise a study committee. Instead, what I have here is a hybrid of what Brookline Town Meeting did with the affirmative statements without the request for a study committee, seeing that we had already commissioned a housing production plan prior. I'm very passionate about this subject. I think it's a good way forward. And um, I provided some resources, I provided the language, as well as the link to the housing production plan, which I drew language from, as well as the uh, link to the Brookline Town Meeting. Um, it's a massive document dump, so I apologize in advance. I'm confident it was like, you had to search through it. And in summation, just to wrap it up, I'm very passionate about it. I think it's a good way forward. Given recent moves with MBTA communities, I think it's uh, also mentioned in the housing production plan as a very 
as a proper vehicle to consider. They didn't outright recommend that it should be the only policy goal, but it was mentioned amongst many others. And with that, I ask that you swiftly um, adopt it for the select board report, and I welcome any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamlin. Mr. Hurd. Thank you. It's good to see you in person. Likewise. It's, this is a sort of a funky situation where you came to us with a zoning article, and usually when we hear zoning, we're like, ugh, <laughs> stay away from me, because we refer that off to our colleagues on the redevelopment board. Um, I th think it's certainly a worthwhile cause, and I think we've done with some of these resolutions in the past few years is where it's not something that really falls within our jurisdiction that we just sort of pass them along to town meeting to have a discussion about and, and, uh, and a vote. <clears throat> so based on that, I'll move positive action. Second. All right. <coughs> uh, question for Mr. Mr. Hellman. Yeah, I um, would also support this. I, I'm a supporter of the overlay districts. I think I, we, I've been encouraged by the evidence I've seen of the communities have used them, and I've long been curious about them as a tool as applied to Arlington with appropriate study. Um, and I, I would say with regard to resolutions, um, you know, I think that it's within town meeting's purview to decide what it wants to make a corporate statement about, whether or not that has a binding result. And I, you know, my personal view is that town meeting is best served when, it, when it's specific to Arlington. I think this is a good example of a, of a resolution that is, and so I'm therefore happy on governance grounds um, to support it as well as my personal um, interest on, on the policy itself. But ultimately, respect the will of town meeting, and I agree with my colleague, Mr. Hurd, that this is really something for town meeting to weigh in on, um, more so on the substance than, than the select board. Um, so, um, any, um, well, I guess I'll make my statement, you know, so, I, you know, I like where we're going here with the, you know, it, it applies to Arlington, you know, it's not, you know, just, just general, because as you may know, you know, trying to try, kind of figure out the, the resolution thing, you know, if it had a study um, group uh, uh, with it, you know, uh, a study committee, it'd be an easy one for me, you know, because uh, that's, that's, that's some action you know, that we're actually going to take out of this. So, yeah, uh, it, it, it's, it, I'm for it, you know, I mean, I'm for better MBTA service, too. It is different, though, as, as my colleague said, it is Arlington-specific, you know, and, and it seems like we are working you know, our way towards this. I mean, so what comes next? Let's say, you know, it passes. What comes next? Is that a question directed at me? Yes, yes. What comes next? Yeah. I can only imagine what could come next. I don't want to speculate. Um, I think that if this is adopted by town meeting, um, as is or with an amendment, it would demonstrate, similar to Brookline Town Meeting, an affirmation of values based off of existing work done by their town as to mitigate the worst of the housing crisis. Um, again, I don't want to speculate beyond that, but I think that drawing from the housing production plan with their suggested strategies um, and providing policy goals, I think it's appropriate for town meeting to chime in on this, drawing from the housing production plan, reading this resolution, scrutinizing it, amending it to their liking. I'm just happy to enable this conversation because it's something I've been trying to uh, have a discussion on for some time. Right, right. I, I hear you. I, mean, now I don't know I mean, how the uh, moderator is going to handle resolutions, you know, just go around. I mean, the past has been, I mean, I mean one side speaks, another side speaks, and there's really no conversation in, in town meeting, just I me, mean, one pro, one con. I mean, and so to the extent there's any conversation, it happens, I mean, when uh, we're doing precinct meetings or people are, are promoting I mean, their, their articles. I mean, uh, and so I, mean, I see the utility there because the I mean, town meetings at least is focused on it at that point in time. I, mean, uh, I, I have to wonder, though, I mean, if it isn't better I mean, to try to co have an extended conversation I mean, with the town through some other mechanism I mean, in order to I mean, get uh, the 
the result that we want I mean, at the point in time. So my concern, you know, with, with these is that, I mean, we, we don't really think beyond, I mean, what we're going to do. That was a very lawyerly-like response. I mean, um, it didn't really, you know, tell me what you really want uh, to do next, I mean, um, and, or what you'd like to see happen next, and that helps me, I mean, think about how do we get from here, I mean, to the destination, because I'm really about trying to get us to the destination and not, I mean, um, um, make a statement, you know, so, so that's where I am on it, um, but, but um, I like where you're going with the, the, the local thing, you know, so, um, uh, so with that, I mean, I'll, I'll, let's see if there are any um, comments um, in Zoom land, you know, questions? Seeing no hands raised in Zoom. Okay, yeah, so, um, um, so, um, any other comments, questions? All right. I mean, so on a motion to um, positive action um, by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mrs. Mahan. Mr. Hahn. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Helmet? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes. Mr. Diggins? Abstain. Abstain. Okay. It's a 4-0-1 uh, vote. Thank you. All right. Excuse me. So Article 68, um, resolution in state tuition. Once again, Mr. Hamlin. Thank you. So this is where it gets a little broader, and I am genuinely seeking your guidance on this. Uh, and I apologize in advance for any facetious delivery I give here. What led me to pursue this is that I genuinely want to see the state of Massachusetts become as progressive on this issue as the state of Texas. I genuinely think that when it comes to in-state tuition for high school students that happen to be either of mixed status are themselves undocumented or of lapsed status, meaning they have a family member that has a green card, they themselves have a green card, but it's expired, and there's that gray area in between where they genuinely send you a sticker to put on the back of your green card to give you a little bit more breathing room, that that shouldn't disqualify you from pursuing higher education. Um, as I've submitted in my resolution as well as the supporting documents, I think that there is enough interest from local agencies in the state of Massachusetts, nonprofit groups, as well as I think it's very clear that there have been many state legislators who have been wanting to tackle this for some time. The reason why I pursued a resolution because I believe that town meeting can, as I said, scrutinize, amend, and advocate for this so we can enable the state legislature to act in an, affor in an affirmative fashion rather than compelling them to demonstrate our values. The way I see it is that imagine although I don't want to speculate too much, but imagine if there is a Arlington High School graduate or even the Minuteman. Um, it doesn't make sense to me to invest in them with public dollars just to cut that off. Their residency isn't in question. Their academic achievement isn't in question. For me, it just seems immoral, unethical, and my bias is that having been an immigrant myself, I'm a naturalized citizen. I didn't have to deal with this issue, but if I had to rely, being a public school, high school graduate here, and wanting to pursue community college and pursue the UMass system, it would have really disturbed me that any sort of lapse, any question of status could be a roadblock to that. And and with that, I uh, ask that you adopt that in your select board report, and I'm open to any questions, and hopefully I'll be more blunt in my responses uh, moving forward. Okay. Thank you. So, I'll turn to my colleagues. Is not. <clears throat> and I'll try to be succinct <coughs> in my questions. Nice to see you in person. Thank you. Fellow colleague in Precinct 14. Of course. Um, I, I, I saw the links that you provided, but I guess I'm just not astute enough to, to actually glean what it is I'm looking for. Um, if the question would come to me, exactly what would be the financial impact in Arlington, you know, for Arlington to extend in-state tu tuition to Arlington student residents? I didn't see that in any of the links. Is that a, a number you can guesstimate for us? No, um, I, I know that previously I said I don't want to speculate. I don't want to speculate for that because I think this is part of a broader conversation I was trying to have. 
while the previous resolution was very within scope about Arlington, this one seems to be a little broader. It was more about an, uh, an affirmative statement for all high school graduates to be able to achieve in-state tuition similar to their other high school students, um, alumni. So if you're looking for something specific to Arlington in that respect, I insufficiently cannot answer that. Sorry, I sufficiently cannot answer that. Okay, and I, and I get that world legally. I'm a court reporter over 30 years, so. Um, but I understand you're saying, you know, you don't want to put a number on it, you don't have a number on it. This, that, that isn't really what you want to do with this. You want to have the bigger conversation, but that's what, what you, you put before us. Um, uh, and I understand you're saying that, you know, uh, you want the state to have this conversation, which I think they are having this conversation. It's, yes. it's the outcome of those conversations that you dispute. Um, so I'm, I'm not, I'm really not in a position to make a motion to support this resolution, even though it should go to town meeting to talk about just because the language that's here, you're telling us, don't pay attention to that language. I want to have a different conversation. And mm. I think that's, that's kind of confusion, confusing. So, but I guess I'll look to my colleagues who I hope I haven't sufficiently confused even more um, in, in, in terms of my conversation. And I'm not going to get into an impending override and a report from the Long Range Planning Committee and where we stand on that. But that's what's before us. So I'd be interested in what my colleagues have to say. Mr. Hurd. I say I agree with the tenor of the statement. I think, and not to put words in my <coughs> colleague's mouth, what Excuse Mr. Me. Diggins has sort of said with some of these resolutions is, all right, what do we accomplish? What's the roadmap? If we have a res like we sent a resolution to the state supporting the ban of redinicides because we, as a board, this in process this discussion at the state legislature and the specific legislation that's in process, we want to support that. So we can do, we're trying to do something, we're prevented by something that the state's doing. Um, and I think we, there's just been a trend in town meeting over the past couple of years to just have, to burn a warrant article on, and not to come down on, this is not specifically talking about yours. Okay. But to have one article to say we think that this is important, um, and it really just goes out into the air, and town meeting agrees that this is important, and we put it to bed. And I think what we really would need to to focus on resolutions that are going to the state legislature or going to whatever the entity is, the federal government, and saying we want you, we're pushing you to pass this specific legislation that's in process. And this is certainly something that is, would quite obviously be done at the state level. We have no authority to, to do anything relative to, to this subject. So, I mean, I would be inclined to support Mrs. Uh, well, if Mrs. Mahan hasn't made a motion. I'll make a motion of no action. Again, just, I think we need to start to, town meeting is a robust being right now. And I think to some extent we need to kind of pare down some of the resolutions to focus. And sometimes it might be 20 resolutions that can't come out of town meeting and it, these re resolutions that are more impactful are one of 20. Whereas, you know, if there were three resolutions at town meeting, these are the three things that we really want to make a dent in and are really important to us. I think, again, I keep saying this not to take away from what you are saying. I agree with you that every graduate, regardless of immigrant status in Massachusetts, should qualify for financial aid in, in state institutions. I just, I mean, that's a whole different discussion with figures and that's beyond our pay grade. And I just don't see this one statement kind of pushing the needle on it. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I think that less is more with with resolutions sometimes and focus is a good thing. 
I also have a little bit of a technical concern with just the wording of the Warren article because I think that it may lead to some confusion. And the, and the, the Warren article is the one that, that can't change. Um, you know, the town can't can't extend into a in, in state tuition. So you know, we can't pay for it. We can't do it. We don't have the power to do that. Um, so I think that. Uh, you know, I, I think it's helpful to have seen the copy of the resolution because the intent is more clear of supporting a policy, which I very much support. I think it's, it's, it's very much the right thing to do. I, I don't think that this is a particularly productive use for, for town meeting uh, just because the statement on that could, could be confusing and probably and be so, so far removed from what Arlington would do that, you know, if, if our, again, it's, it's not in our part of view either, Tom Meany can kind of say what it wants, but if our job here is to say, should Tom Meany weigh in on this, I guess my answer is no. But, uh, but thank you for thinking of it. Thank you for your caring about the community. And, and by the way, I, I wouldn't have known this is your first time coming before us in person. It's very yeah, articulate, it's, it's and I surreal. appreciate that. Thank you. So that was a, a second? I guess that was a very wordy second. Mr. Just, Chair. Just, just making sure. A very well worded, wordy second. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Hutton. No problem. No problem. So, so, um, so um, any other comments? You know, so, um, <laughs> it's, um, I, I hear what everyone is saying, you know, and, and you know, I, I, I thought that I was going to have to say, you know, I'm going to be inconsistent on this one, you know, because uh, I mean, I, you know, this one, you know, I feel this one, you know, and I agree with my colleagues, it's, it's, not, it's not anything that we can do, you know, as a, 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 you know, as a town on this, you know, but I really do want to see what I, as a resident, can do with you um, in order to try to make he, something change here. You know, he, I'm not really that aware of what's going on he, on, on the state level. You know, it's a point of ignorance. You know, uh, but I'd like to learn more about what's going on at the state level. You know, and and work with you uh, on it. You know, in order to try, you know, to figure out he, what can be done. You know, because uh, to say, yeah, I mean. Uh, it will cost the state more I mean, to educate you know, um, the kids, I mean, but it costs us a whole lot more not to, you know, I mean, as a state and as a society. So I think I mean, you know, I mean, we need to figure out I mean, how, how, how to do this. I mean, and so, so I feel better about you know, voting no action on this, I mean, uh, making a commitment uh, to you to work on this, I mean, just I me, mean, not make community board or anything, just me as a, a person to um, learning more about this and seeing what we can do you know, on the state level. Because I like, <laughs> I'm gonna say this, I have, no, I have no ambitions state level, but I like, I like working with me you now, folks on, on the state level uh, um, and, and finding out like what senator you know, um, is, is focused on this and, and what chief of staff I mean, um, is, is, is working on this I mean, because um, there are um, a lot of good people in the state level who are really trying to uh, make, make real change. I mean, so so um, I'm going to go along with it, but once again, I'm really committed because this is something that society knows a little about, but, but um, I mean, learning about it, I'm sure will come in handy, I mean, um, not only for this, but as other things. So, so, um, so uh, at this point, I'll open it up to um, the um, audience here. Well, I guess there's James, me and, uh, and Zoomland. <laughs> No hands in Zoom. Okay. All right. Any other comments, questions? All right. So on a uh, motion of no action by Mr. Hurd and a second by Mr. Helmuth, Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCourcy. Yes. yes. Mr. Helmuth. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Diggins. Yes. It's an unanimous vote. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. All right. So moving on. You know, Possible update, expansion of overnight permit parking pilot <coughs> by myself and Mr. Corsi, you know. So should I turn to you, Mr. Corsi, or? I think, I, I, think, I, I was going to defer to you on this because okay. I, I appreciated your outreach to me in, in sure. terms of where, what, what happened uh, since our last meeting. Sure, sure, sure. So um, since our last meeting, have, have this idea that we want to run past you all to see if we should uh, pursue it further. Okay, so the idea is that we would 
limit the number of permits mean to the number of spaces mean that are available uh, in the municipal lots. I mean, uh, we don't have an exact number on that now. We, we, we know that the floor is 300, I mean, uh, 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 but we're not sure what the, um, the ceiling is. I mean, and so uh, what would happen is someone would I mean, apply for a permit, ask for a permit. I mean, uh, uh, we, we would ask them why. I mean, we're probably not going to reject, you know, uh, but they would get a spot in a municipal lot and they could either use that spot <coughs> or a spot, I mean, near, hopefully in front of their place, one side of the street, you know. And so what that does is, well, first it caps, I mean, the number of permits, you know, and the pilot, you know, and secondly, it gives people a place to go when they have to get their cars off the road, I mean, be it for snow, I mean, or even like street cleaning or whatever I mean, DPW needs to do uh, uh, with the street, you know, and and the rate would be $365 in a year as it currently is, I mean, with the same um, process for for um, getting uh, a waiver on it, you know, and and, um, and 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 what it does too is like I mean, we can take a pause. At whatever point we want as we approach winter but since now they have a place to put their cars you know uh, it would allow us to, to push through and if we wanted to extend uh the the pilot you know so right now I mean, we have about 50 um, persons using the pilot you know and so so if uh, we were to I mean, expand it up to 300 it gives quite a bit of headroom you know um, uh, so if it ends up being oversubscribed, I mean, that tells us some information. If it's not, if it's undersubscribed, that tells us information too. I mean, but we would I mean, at least initially keep it I mean, at whatever number of cars in a lot. And one more statement. Okay. Uh, uh, and, so, and so they would be assigned a lot. I mean, and so, so it's not like we'd say, okay, well, I mean, there are 300 spaces I mean, in all the lots. I mean, uh, you pick I mean, um, um, when there's an emergency. I mean, it's like when you apply. Me, you would then be assigned a lot so that we, you would know where to go. I mean, so, so, um, so, um, so, Mr. Eric. Um, I guess you answered my question by saying 300, but do we cap the number of uh, permits that we give for people to park in our lots? It's That's capped at 300. Is that the most that we'll give out for people to park in municipal lots overnight? We have. Mr. Chairman, I, I, I don't think we're close to that number, so it, 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 yeah. there's not really a, a cap on it. Right. it the, okay. the actual use right now is far lower. Right. Okay. It, it, and it, so there, there, I don't think there ever was a decision made. We're going to cap okay. it at this right. amount. Right. Um, I guess I'm concerned about. It depends on. So I'll back up to my question. When you said 50 people are using the pilot, who are you referring to? No, 50 people use it. If I said pilot, I misspoke. I said there are 50 you know, people who are using the municipal oh, lot. Oh, so 50 is, is a use okay. Yeah. I, I was like, did I miss this pilot stuff? No, no, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I misspoke. Sorry about that. No. The subcommittee was very active. We <laughs> you don't remember you gave a great speech before um, that vote. Yeah. I mean, I, I think my concerns are pro could be much ado about nothing if not that many people are going to use it. I guess my concern at, at capping the number of, if all of a sudden we say, all right, anybody that wants overnight parking can go and do it, and a swath of people come in, and they get, you know, up in the heights or in places where we really don't need it, apply for permits, and then there's nothing left. Then people that come in that say, oh, I just rented a place on Grafton Street, and I'm in a two family and I don't have parking and we say oh sorry we're we're out of overnight permits it's just, it's just concerning to me that people that need it I guess the former Tufts economist in me calls it a inefficient distribution of resources when people when people don't need it get something and then other people's blocked out of it so I'm yeah I'm open to hear other comments on it it just it, makes me a little bit concerned and if that's just for the pilot and then we know that you know there's more of a demand and we have to address that post pilot then I could probably go along with that 
I just, uh, I think it's one of these things we, we really don't know right now. Right. We're kind of talking hypothetical numbers based on the people that have been involved in the conversation. Who is actually, and I think if you charge $365 a year, that's probably going to put the request under 300 because that in itself is going to limit this to the people that really need it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I like the idea of the permit simultaneously allowing people to park in municipal lots. Although, I'm, if there's a snow emergency, are people allowed to park in municipal lots or do they have to clear out of there as well? They have to clear out. They have yeah. to clear out. We they have to go to over to Al Wife or something. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Because thought... they need to clear the lots for yeah. schools and. Oh. We direct them to the Al Wife parking garage. Oh, see, I thought, I thought that I mean, they no. had the ability to move. No. To... So maybe we have to flush this out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that was so, so hard. It's hard. No. <clears throat> Since this is a, pos a possible update, this possibly could be relevant, but um, as we're going further on down the road, um, part of me feels like we're shying away from the original model in place, which is what the, the town policy is, and on a case-by-case -case basis, people coming in and, and asking for some relief from that. So um, I guess the further down the road question is, um, then that particular avenue should be gotten eliminated, eliminated if <clears throat> we uh, have the pilot and adopt it going forward. So um, I, I sometimes feel like we're doing this because of, you know, those are tough decisions, and I'll leave that on the table. But the other thing that I just want to make clear for myself, and I'm just one vote, is um, and someone whose family rented, never owned a home. We lived on Akerton Road, we lived on, we rented, big huge um, driveway. No cars could park in there. We couldn't afford one anyways, but even if we did, um, and the rent, was adjusted and then anatomy manner, again, certain things. Um, and also keeping in mind, we're also pushing people, not pushing, we're encouraging people to think of different ways moving forward, whether it's electric cars, whether it's alternative <coughs> um, vehicle transport. Um, to me, this seems like it's opening, but I would be very firm in my stance if I were, it got to that point to take a, a a vote on a pilot and or anything moving forward that I do not think we should turn the public streets into a, a public parking, parking garage. I would like to see if we do have a pilot program and or anything permanent after that, we do adopt one of the rules that we have, which is you can only park overnight in front of your residence. Because um, I can see other people saying, I wasn't in favor of this. Um, I let my neighbor across the street <clears throat> I just saw this on Gray and Fountain. I was talking to someone. Um, park their uh, child's uh, vehicle over here. I don't want someone in front of my street, in front of my house. I didn't avail myself of the opportunity to uh, go into the pilot program. <clears throat> they never move their car. So when it comes through street sweeping, snow plowing, um, they're not mindful of the fact that you parked in such a way that I really can't even make my swing into my driveway anymore because you don't live here. So, and what I'm af afraid of is that, um, and I do know someone who grew up in the, in the renter's world, that sometimes you get an apartment and because there's no parking included, and if you are in the position that you can afford a vehicle, which my family did it until I was in high school, one vehicle, that's reflective in the rent, but. Um, I don't want this to turn into that at 23 Egerton Road, which is where I rented, that there's a pilot program and a landlord goes out and says, listen, you all can have four or five cars each floor because you can basically park up and down Egerton Road. I think moving forward, and I know I'm getting ahead of myself on this, but I just want to maybe as you're having future discussions pose that question if other people feel that way. I would not be in favor of a pilot parking program that says, well, you can get two, three, four cars 
and just park them wherever. I would like it to mirror what we have when we hear individual parking requests that um, if there's one spot and sometimes there's two in front of your house, it's no more than that. Because, you know, I don't, I don't want to see it. And, and I can tell you as someone who's grown, grown up in, in the renting world, um, you really look for an apartment you can afford, an apartment that meets your needs, and you also really look for an apartment that you can say, listen, you don't really have parking here, so can you come down on the rent a little bit? And that really does happen. I'm not, you know, I'm not just making that up and then pulling it out of there. But I'm just hearing, and I may just be speculating, as Mr. Hamble would say, on something that isn't the case, but I'm hoping if there is a pilot program that you can only get whatever it is your frontage is on the public street in front of your house so that you can't come in and say, well, I need four or five of them, and I'm taking 12 Egerton Road all the way down to 26 Egerton Road because I got five cars. So I just want to put that out. And, and I don't know if, it, if, if in the forums that's come up, um, but I would be interested. Um, but I anticipate at the forums you have people that are either strong pro <clears throat> or strong con. So, but I think... Um, moving forward that if this board got into a <coughs> pilot program that, you know, um, if it were 300 spaces, but we got one or two residents on a street that asked for more than their frontage, um, I think that's just a whole a can of worms are opening that's just going to make this, it, it could be the doom side of the pilot program. So I'll stop there. Well, I mean, interesting <coughs> points. I mean, it could certainly be one element to it. It could be I mean, one one car per address, you know, uh, and, and so, so I'll take the limitations, you know. And yeah, with regards to the snow thing, it's, it's funny because every time, I, mean, I talk to a few people, I mean, not a lot, but every time I, mean, I talk, I mean, the snow thing was like the point, one of the points. I mean, street sweeping. So, yeah, yeah, well, street street, that, that was that was the secondary one, but it's like, yeah, so that we, we would have a place when these people said they wanted the cars off the road, the suites, they'd have a place to go. Me. So, so it will still hold for st street sweeping. It just won't hold for snow, no. you know. Uh, and and so, because we're really trying to. In fact, that was kind of what kind of sp sparked the idea of like, well, they'll have a place to take their cars and when we need to get them off the road for mm -hmm. for uh, for snow. But but I guess as long as they can uh, he, find some place, I mean, he, I guess I wouldn't want to not do that because of the snow argument, you know. Uh, and so they'll. they'll They'll have to get them off, and, and and we'll have a way to communicate with them because it will be registered, you know. But I I I, you know, I think limiting to one car per household because either it has to be like right in front or on the other side of the street, right in front. I mean that gives us a rationale, I mean for limiting it to one, you know, uh, as opposed to you know, trying to create an economic disincentive by charging more for the second car. I mean, so so. Um, yeah, all right. You know, I hear that. Well, the whole reason for bringing these things up um, is... Thank you is, for uh, allowing me to digress. No, it wasn't a digression at all. Okay. I mean, that's just relevant, you know. Uh, so, oh, oh. so, Mr. Yeah, Carson. no, no, it's all helpful yeah. in this moment because, it, and I appreciate the chair. Um, it, this <clears> is in response to the last forum. There was a number of comments in terms of concern about um, the number of people that would participate in this program, and I think you know, what you heard tonight was... Um, Maybe that's a way to limit what we do for for the pilot. But um, Chair and I spoke about it, and, and I thought it was good to get it out to the board for for feedback. And, and um, you know, we're still going through a process here. There was a number of different comments and concerns that we heard that we're still processing from the forum, and, and we'll continue to work. Yeah, yeah. One of you want to say something? Yeah, we're done. Uh, Okay, so because I might forget if I don't, <laughs> so I'll just go ahead. So, so yeah, so the other is that uh, uh, we did hear about guest parking, you know, and, and, and so uh, and, and we might want to explore maybe either uh, making that, uh, allowing more days for that, as I told uh, Mrs. Corsi. Uh, it comes at a cost, I mean, and so I mean, at some point, I mean, it might be worth it for them to get in a spot, you know, to pay for it. So I think I mean, we can certainly explore that as part of the, um, either the pilot or, or just an adjustment in, in our parking policy. Mr. Helmuth. 
Thank you. Um, I appreciate creative thinking here. It's intriguing. Another thing I really like is that this is more responsive to not only the public forums, but I think trying to get back to the original problem we're trying to solve, which might be a smaller scale than we need. And so I'm really interested in not trying to oversolve for that problem, whatever that is. Um, and I think we heard that a lot of people in the community are a little concerned about that too. I am, I would be, I have some questions about this and I, I think as you go along, I, I'd like to hear more about it basically as, as you continue working on it, I encourage you to do so. Um, one of those would be uh, what does happen in the winter? What, you know, if, if this is a proposal <coughs> divorce, would we tell people in this program, this is a pilot through the fall, but, but our intention would be to return these cars off the street in the winter. You know, in other words, because we talked about um, if we did a larger pilot, town-wide pilot, that we think that would stop, could stop in the winter. We might be one of those towns like other municipalities that just don't have winter overnight parking. So I think we would want to know, exactly, we'd want to know, is that going to be the case with this group of, of permits? If, if it's different, if we would say, yeah, this is probably not going to be a winter uh, street permit, how is that different? We would need to know, how is that different from the current waivers, the case-by-case -case waivers that we have now? Um, because I think that they're allowed to stay on you know, in the winter. So we have to think that through. And I don't know the answer. I'm just bringing that up as a refinement to think about. Um, I, if there is a way to make it need-based, I'd be interested in that so that Again, we're responsive to the original problem we're trying to solve, which is people coming to us and saying that the current waiver program isn't, I, didn't, I wasn't eligible for this, but I still have a hardship because of multiple jobs or the composition of the household. Those are the people I've wanted to help through this process. I'm less interested in a big change in the town until we were to do a lot more systematic study, hire a professional uh, planner or having our own planning department really to walk us through the options for a larger scale wholesale change. So, so I love the surgical nature of this and, and if a need-based approach to that committee, to that permit would be legal and, and, and possible and fair, I'd be interested in knowing what that is um, as well. And I think it, it's an interesting concept to tie it to the town lots and to, and to assign someone to a lot as a place they can go. I also didn't know that we, that we couldn't send people to the town uh, lots because for during a snow emergency, so that's a little bit of a wrinkle. But I think really what that accomplishes is a limited number of permits. So you know, even if the town lot thing one to one doesn't end up working out, I'm pretty interested in, in keeping the number of permits small, so that if our intent is to help um, a more <coughs> circumscribed universe of people who have a need, rather than saying this is now a place you can park overnight in general, I'd be interested. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think her comment, it just occurred to me, it's just food for thought with no response needed, that I wonder, it almost, we complicate this so much, and like the select board has these certain check the box type things that, that we said that, oh, if you have parking, you can't come. And you wonder if ultimately you just get to the point where we don't change much, and, you make the process still that you have to apply to the select board. You have to come here, mm. and you have to say to us, "I need it because this, this, and this." And we say, "Okay," <laughs> and we, we don't have some pre-prescribed. Re I'm sure Attorney Hyman will say that we can't differ. The certain things that we can't differentiate if somebody has the same type of application. But if you make the process, you got to pay the fee. You got to come to the board. That's going to weed out a certain amount of people, and if some, I think most of the requests are going to be ones that will approve, or if it's you know, guy with big driveway up in you know in the Stratton area who just doesn't feel like parking in his driveway or just wants to be able to park in the street, we say ah this this isn't really what we're what we're doing here, and give the board discretion. As opposed to some, old, I think this is one of those things you start pulling at the string and like, 
it's like, well, this comes up, well, this comes up. It, it gets so overly complicated. It's just we relax our rules that we take. We still require people to come, pay a fee, and that naturally is going to weed out kind of the superfluous, superfluous applications. Um, so I'll add that to the discussion and no response required again. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, I actually, that was one of the things I was talking to the chair after the last forum that said maybe that is an option that we just relax the standards. And that's one of the things that was really helpful <clears throat> about that last forum because, it, as we've said, every time we <clears throat> go through a round of talking as a group or talking to the public or in, in having a forum, it gets more and more complicated. And, and, and so I think we still work and we try to find a solution here, but that's something that did occur, I think, to both of us after, after, uh, after that last forum. But um, because it's at, at the end of the day, you can't answer every question, but you do want to solve a problem because there, I still maintain there are equity issues out there that we need to address related to parking, and and that, that's 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 why we, you know, primary reason really why we want to do this. Well, and and we we uh, well this this proposal relaxed the standards in that it kind of just eliminated them, we, and, and said just you're going to get it. Tell us why you want it, yep. and, and hopefully because they know they're going to get it. They tell us really why they want it, you know, and and, and if uh, a lot of them are not needs based, me just kind of want based, it'd be good to know that, you know, uh, uh, because it would help us be, uh, if we decided to do the pilot again, me because we would say to folks, me here's the cap, me we're ending it, me the pilot at X amount of time, we get to assess me what happened, you know, and. And you know, pilots are pilots. I mean, you get a limited amount of information from it, you know, uh, but at least that would help you, you decide you know, how to move forward with understanding that there are you know, limitations. So, 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 so um, that's where we are. I mean, I, you know, whether they come here or not, I mean, I guess, if, I guess I mean, part of me says, well, we may end up with a lot of people, but hopefully that won't be the case because of the limit, you know what I mean? You know, so, so I mean, I can argue much, argue both ways. You know, but but the, I think the thinking now is that they just would come to the select, select board's office, or I mean, at least have a conversation with someone in the select board's office, so that they can tell them the rules, you know, and that they have to get the car off the street, get information from them, I mean, so that they can be contacted. You know, yes, Ms. Hurd. And I, again, I don't want to drag this conversation out, but just note that with our current system, they only have to come to the select board <coughs> one time to get an approval. After that, they're automatically right. are renewed right. the permit. Right. So where we, it's potent, it, it could be that we get inundated, and we have to, maybe we say we're going to hear all your applications in June or whenever we're a little slower yeah. if that time ever comes. Um, but once that you get over the initial hump, you're only hearing applications really as someone moves into town or whatnot. So. I'll get to the next chair to program. <laughs> Whoever that may be. <laughs> so, 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 Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, just what, um, this is a really great conversation. I think I, I do, I don't, I, I, when I first joined the board, I, I, one of the, my first reactions to one of the first hearings of this is the boys, are, our rules for the waivers are really strict. And I, and I had a couple of thoughts like, you know, what if we found a uniform and fair way to change the check boxes, basically, in a way that was that we that we could still and we I, I think I might be interested in the ability, in a fair and equitable way, to say no to some people, so that this you know that we did target this to the problem to the, the problems we want to help people with, and and you know that's going to be we, we, a pilot program could help us understand that need better and see if we're if we've got the scope too wide or too narrow. Um, but, and I think some of Mrs. Mahan's ideas are worth considering about limiting, constraining somewhere where they, where they could park. But, you know, but, but all that I think is in, in the details and uh, I look forward to uh, this thing, maybe a refined version of this. I appreciate your work. So, Mr. Heim, I think you have a sense of the conversation we're going to be having next. Do you, do you want to have any of it now? <laughs> No, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I second that. <laughs> um, 
Since, since we have the, the benefit of, of our town manager's presence and experience here, um, realizing that I didn't ask you this in advance and that I apologize, do you, do you, you've been with the town for a long time, you know the town departments really well, both the DPW, the police, the community, you talk, hear from residents. Um, do you have any advice for us at this stage um, on this any of these ideas? Um, I've had many conversations with several of you about these issues. Um, and I would say that the, I don't because it really just comes down to some sort of policy decisions that you have to make that are thankfully in your realm and not mine. <laughs> that's why we get the big bucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's it. All right. Yeah. yeah. All right. It's an excellent deflection. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you could have said, I don't want to speculate. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, you know, well then I think we've um, talked ourselves out on this. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Yeah, so um, moving on. Um, correspondence received, crosswalk concerns near Jason Street, Hillsdale Road, Pleasant View Road, um, Thomas Gorin. Sorry, <coughs> this is beginning to go here. And, and number 11, need for periodic facilities department reports, uh, Barbara Thornton. Uh, so, it's heard. Motion to receive and refer number 10 to TAC and refer number 11 to, I would say, the town manager and the chair to discuss. Second and a comment. Yes, Ms. Mahan. Um, <coughs> 10 is self-explanatory and I agree with that. I agree with both things. 11 is really a bone of contention for pretty much as long as uh, we started to find a, a facilities uh, department and a facilities director and um, it, it certainly is something that I don't expect the current town manager to uh, necessarily have the amount of time to move on and make this happen but since we started the road going down the road of having a facilities department a facilities director and this all predates all my colleagues' service on the board. But since whatever that year was, and I've kind of given up on it because, you know, there's only so many times you can bark something out, and then you get the message even though you... Um, when we did that, what I said from the very beginning, and this kind of goes back to my days of when I worked, um, it's now Verizon, but in the phone company, and I said how... Even back then, all there was was uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3 and D-Base 3, and I was just a good secretary, which is now an administrative assistant, 1, 2, 3, 4, depending on the level. Um, but that I made it a point for the 79 line men and women that I load, loaded their daily schedule with to go out to repair, replace, uh, perform maintenance on trunks and senders and mainframes, that I was able to do that in a program that didn't really exist, um, but definitely saw the benefits to that. And also you could use that program to say if you have these five employees that work for the phone company, Mr. Corsi <coughs> is, is really good on those mainframes that nobody can seem to figure out you know, what the problem is first, let alone, and Mr. Diggins is, boy, he's up and down that pole, and, you know, he's got all the equipment, and he knows how to load his tool belt. And I've been told since we went down on this journey, oh, yes, that, that we can do that now, because we have the facilities director, we have this fantastic software program called School Dog or, or, or something, School dude. Uh, school dude, school dude, school yeah. dude, and you got to get those. And I said, well, I, if I could just get them maybe even twice a year, because I know what I went through to create something like that. And once it's done, it's really just a click of the button to say, print that report. Well, yeah, you're going to get that. Never have gotten one to this day. So I'm venting with the current town manager, Mr. Pooler, because I was told, oh, no, we got, no, we got this school dude. It's a push of the button. You can get that. And I said, and I'm not doing this. One thing I don't want to do is go through an exhaustive waste of somebody's time that basically creates work that, you know, you're a brand new boss and you come in and say, well, I want you to Xerox everything on zoning bylaws and I'd like two copies and one and three hole punch and one not. That's just making work do. But 
the reason why I wanted to see this was, especially with um, the fire stations, our school buildings, our now community center, former senior center, et cetera, uh, as well as our rental properties, like Parmenter, is that one of the questions I asked is, um, is there a way, and if it's too much work, I don't, too cumbersome, I don't want this. No, it's a click of the button, I'm told. Um, not only will I be able to see for, say, Stratton School is the facility, uh, I can see the equipment that's in there, I can see new purchases, but can I see along with that, you purchased five trunks and five mainframes, I'm just using words. Uh, the, f the five trunks have uh, recommended every five year warranty and the mainframes have 10. Here's your five, two were bought in this year, one was bought three years later, and here's where you are in that cycle. So I can see that some of the biggest costs we have is in um, criticisms that I would get is that, you know, you buy this stuff and you're not maintaining it. Well, that's why we created a facilities department and we have a facilities director and we have this great school dude. So I went way too long on that. I'm posing it again and I'll pose it with the future town manager that that is something that um, I'd really like to see. Um, I'm told it's very easy, it can be done. I've never received it, so I'm, you know, taking advantage of the opportunity. So, thank you. Any other? Mr. Helms? I just wanted to invite the town manager. Did you have any, any, any information you could share to eliminate, or do you understand if you want to do that at a future meeting? But. Uh, I will briefly say, um, seeing this letter, I did uh, look into that. Um, I obviously was not uh, it, aware of Ms. Mahan's question, so didn't prepare that. I will say that in both the um, annual town report and in the fiscal plan, we have extensive reports about what the facilities department does, uh, their accomplishments from previous years, what their goals and objectives are in, in the future, and, and to some extent some uh, uh, work measures. Um, I think the uh, issues that uh, Select Board Member Mahan raised are go beyond what's in here. Um, some of them are easy to push for the button, some are not. It really relates to the issue of having a preventive maintenance program in place. Um, I think we've been moving in that direction. Um, and so I think that's something that I will report back to the board on with more specificity. Um, and uh, I do know at one point we were using School Dude. We stopped using it for a while for some internal reasons. And I think uh, Rob Barrett has tried to get it up running more. Um, all of which is to say that I'd be happy to report back to the board with more information about uh, some of the issues that I've heard expressed tonight. I think they're important issues, um, but I think also just having uh, a good explanation of how we're approaching the facilities and the equipment and the maintenance of those things is the core of the issues that are, are important to talk about, and I will get back to the board. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Manager. All right, anything else? Yeah, well, I mean, <coughs> Mr. Mr. Poole and I had talked about it uh, this morning also, and so essentially what Mr. Hurd, this is on item 11, had, had recommended was exactly uh, what was, is going to happen, I mean, and so uh, we'll be following up on this, I mean, and, and we'll, uh, we'll um, probably have an update, I mean, in the next meeting or two, I mean, even if it's to say we need more time, you know, for, for an update, but I want to um, I mean, learn more uh, about this, I mean, it's, it's um, I mean, I've heard it, a number of times, sometimes a little slow, though, a little dense, I mean, and so it finally penetrated this time, and I kind of like, oh, that's, I mean, it really did help to have that presentation that, that Ms. Norton sent along, and then now I had, like, the whole history of how the facility department came into existence, and then what the expectations were, and, uh, uh, and, and so, so, um, so yeah, I mean, um, let's find out what has been 
done. You know, if, if any information has been generated, that's been disseminated me to a town meeting. You know, and 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 then um, if not, I mean, um, let's start it. I mean, if it has been, let's see if we can extend from there. But but um, but yeah. So um, we'll we'll get some we'll get some motion on this. So so on a motion by Mr. Hurd, you know, to send ten to TAC. Yeah, another issue. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and 11 I mean, to the town manager and myself, you know, and a second by, by Ms. Mahan. Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd? Yes. Mr. DeCourcy? Yes. Mr. Helmuth? Yes. Mrs. Mahan? Yes, thank you. Mr. Davis? Yes. Generous vote. Great. All righty. New business. Ms. Meyer? No new business, thank you. Mr. Heim? No new business, thank you. <laughs> Mr. Pollard? Uh, I just want to announce that uh, <coughs> Alex. McGee started uh, in the manager's office today as a new deputy town manager. Uh, I will set up a time for him to come and meet you. Uh, but uh, for those of you at home, he is the deputy town manager and finance director, and I've made him look at a lot of spreadsheets today. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, it, it just over the weekend or, or for this month that, that the Robbins Library has a program Arlington reads together. And uh, this month's book, or this year's book, uh, was by an author named Judy Human. The book was called Being Human, an, Unreprent an Unrepentant Memoir of a Disability Rights a ad Activist. And of course, tonight, when we were talking about the self-service <laughs> gas stations, we were talking about ADA concerns. Um, she was 75 years old. She was due to come to Arlington, and, uh, to, to the Robbins Library via Zoom, to talk about her book and take questions. Unfortunately, she passed away on Saturday at the age of 75, but she was a remarkable activist, um, really led a sit-in in 1977 in a federal office in San Francisco, um, basically to enact regulations under the Rehabilitation Act, which was a predecessor to the ADA, and, and we talk about the ADA so often, and, and she was an activist. Her work led to the passage of it in 1990. I purchased the book last week, and it started, and I was really sorry to see her passing. I encourage everybody, the library is still going to have a program on March 19th, um, well, worth, well worth reading um, about, about her life and, and the impact that she had. No, no business. Mr. Hurd. Um, I wanted to congratulate the Arlington Boys and Girls Hockey Teams for great seasons. They unfortunately met their demise on the same night. Um, and as I was thinking about it, I, I, every time that the rink's packed and it was packed like I never saw last night, it always makes me wonder if, speaking of the facilities department, one of the last time the Bleaches at Ed Burns Arena had a structural engineer look at him. School dog can tell I, you I that. Say, I say that sort of <laughs> facetiously, but also seriously, yeah, right. because there seemed in the new way era of how they do high school games. Now the first couple games of the Division One tournament are at Ed Burns Arena, and the past couple of years you, you have they're packed out, and the kids are jumping up and down and. And so, I mean, you've seen yeah. incidents happen in that. So it is something that I, I have meant to ask the town manager. I initially said I have to ask Mr. Chaffelain, so I have to ask Mr. Pooler to potentially take a look at that. And what I'm sure they looked at from time to time, but it is something that I think would be worth taking a look at. Since I had the time to. Yeah. <laughs> Bleacher so stress load yeah. report. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. This uh, is a point of business for my colleagues on the board, and the theme of this is better late than never. <laughs> um, a year after I said I would, I have finally gone through the select board handbook and updated it to bring it up to date. No substantive policy changes <coughs> whatsoever, but try an effort to. Uh, update numbers and facts and bring things in compliance with what we're actually doing. So um, I just wanted to give you a heads up. I've sent it off to, and Mr. DeCourcy gave me a, an assistant a couple of points, sent it off to our board administrator to with some specific requests and tasks. Uh, I'm sure she was thrilled given that you have nothing else whatsoever to do right now. 
uh, but with the hope that we could, uh, I could have uh, asked her to send it around to you for just a look over to make sure I got it all right and contribute any uh, suggestions to her and that we could adopt it uh, before the town election. Right. And did you, and Mr. Chair, yeah, you anticipate like it would be set up so it's sort of like red line? It, in fact, it is very much a red line. Okay. Yeah. Or, or something that doesn't yeah, have no, to yeah, necessarily yeah, be that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, no Does it say meetings will be a max of 45 minutes? Yes, I did make that change. <laughs> <laughs> when Mrs. Mahan's not here. Uh, <laughs> well, you finally got your name at it, right? <laughs> well, I, that might have been a motivation. <laughs> Yours too, I think. No, I was there. Oh, you were on the last one. That was the last one. Right. Right. I did add you, finally. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 and I, and I, I'll just oh, add that. Whatever <laughs> <laughs> uh, it takes, you know. <laughs> We'll get the discussion about the beautification committee on for next week, you know, I, I just failed to get it on for this week. So I'm saying it now and asking Ms. Meyer to help me remember to I get it on. <laughs> it was my fault. I, I did not. Eat. The, the agenda is the chair's responsibility and I just forgot uh, to, to add it. So uh, just letting everyone know that we're still going to have that discussion. So um, with that, I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. And so on a motion, I was joined by Mr. Helmut and a second by Mr. Corsi. Mr. Heim. Mr. Hurd. Yes. Mr. DeCorsi. Yes. Mr. Helmut. Yes. Mrs. Mahan. Yes. Mr. Dickens. Yes. It's unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you.